Uh, this is in response to having uh, Barry Silver and Robert Watson here in the last two forums who spoke um, anti-administration. Uh, and now we're going to talk about uh, how and why our uh, president is such a good president and his accomplishments of the first 100 days. And, uh, and uh, then we'll have a very robust discussion after for people who agree and people who don't agree. But everybody's invited to participate in the discussion. Keep it civil. Al, thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. Um, hi, Viscaya. Uh, I've been here before. Uh, John Stewart had a show a couple of years ago, I don't know if you remember, uh, where he had Republicans and Democrats, and he had all the Democrats he could handle from the community, but he couldn't find any Republicans. So I got a call and I rousted up some Republicans and we had the show here. I don't know if any of you remember. I don't even know if it was in this room. My name is Alan Bergstein. Uh, uh, I'm a retired New York City junior high school principal from the South Bronx. Uh, I'm a military veteran of the Korean War, um, father of four kids, and uh, I am the editorial writer for a Jewish weekly in New York City uh, an English language Jewish weekly called the Jewish uh, Voice. And I do their editorials once a week and uh, I do speaking engagements and I have an allergy. Uh, and I do a couple of speaking engagements a week and uh, I see no reason why there should even be a call, honestly, uh, for uh, civility. You know, we're all Americans and we have different viewpoints. Uh, we have different religions, we have different uh, ways of bringing up children, we have different attitudes, and we should all get together and say, listen, this is our country, this is one country. And only together will we achieve uh, our liberties and, and our independence. I know Robert Watson. Uh, I was on a TV show with him a couple of years ago. Uh, I know he's a conservative, uh, sorry, liberal professor from Lynn University and Barry Silva. I know Barry Silva very well. <clears throat> I just called him this yesterday. He uh, is recovering. He's in Cleveland Clinic recovering from surgery and he hopes to be back in his synagogue Friday night. Barry and I have debated for years. For years. He is the, uh, the liberal guy and I'm the conservative guy. And my concern with both of those guys is, is I like both of those guys. They're both very intelligent. But when they speak to their own group uh, Watson and Lynn University and Barry Silva in his uh, Lador Vador synagogue over here in Woolbright, they have a captive audience. They have a captive audience. Uh, these uh, young kids at Lynn University worship Watson, good looking guy, ex football player, blah, 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 speaks well. And Barry Silva is a rabbi. So I go into audiences that are somewhat not with me. They uh, have their audiences set, you know, captive audience. I don't. So here I, here I am, and uh, I, I'm very happy to be here today. And I want you to ask me any questions. I've been through 20 years in the South Bronx uh, as a, a principal of a junior high school. I was in South Jamaica, Queens, and South Brooklyn. So uh, nothing really can bother me. So let me have it, you know, when you're finished. Um, a little bit uh, about myself. Uh, I was born in Brooklyn, Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, and uh, I was born a Jewish umbilical cord Democrat. Jewish umbilical cord Democrat. I had to be a Democrat. My parents were, my uncles were, my cousins were. I was raised as a Democrat. At 13 years old, my father was a waiter in New York City. He was a shop steward of uh, the restaurants he was at, a union man, of course. And I had my first union card when I was 13 years old. I was washing dishes uh, in a restaurant in the, Wo in the uh, uh, Woolworth building in Manhattan. I started. And then I became a teacher. I, uh, a found I'm a founding member of the United Federation of Teachers in New York City in 1958. I'm a charter member of the UFT. It's now the AFT. And I still have my union card with my supervisory union. So I've been through this. I've been through this. But uh, things change. And I change. Uh, we have different eating habits from when we were kids. We have different clothing habits, so forth and so on. 
and I changed. And my change was basically right here in Delray Beach. When I moved down to Florida in 1992, I immediately joined the West Delray South County Democrat Club. They had the, that was the big, a thousand members. The West Delray South County Democrat Club. My dear friend was Jack Babich. His memorial plaque is on Atlantic Avenue. Have you, you've passed it by a thousand times. A thousand times. Jack Babich was my dear friend. Uh, Murray Kalish was there. And that's where I met uh, Bert Aronson. And uh, in uh, 1994, Louis Farrakhan came down to South Florida to speak. Louis Farrakhan, Nation of, Israel, Nation of Islam, the biggest Jew hater in the country today. You know Louis Farrakhan. He came down to speak in Palm Beach, and he had sitting on the dais next to him a woman by the name of Maud Ford Lee. Any, anyone remember Maud Ford Lee? She was the Democrat county commissioner, equivalent of Bert Aronson. She was one of the five county commissioners. She sat on the dais with Louis Farrakhan, and she was interviewed that night. And she said, I am staunchly for Louis Farrakhan and what he says. And she was asked by a reporter from the Palm Beach Post, I don't have a copy of that paper, that was in 1994. She, said, she was asked, do you believe in what he said? She said, I believe in everything he said. The next meeting of the West, Count, uh, West Delray South County Democrat Club, I got up and I wanted to, and I offered a motion to condemn Louis Farrakhan and Maud Ford Lee for the Jew hating that was expressed on the podium that night. That's why I wanted to pass a, a, a motion, I made a motion and passed to have a resolution to condemn them for what they said. 500 people in the audience screamed at me, yelled at me, a couple of guys grabbed my hand. I was younger then, I pushed them away. One of the officers of the club took a swing at me in the lobby, called me a name. How dare I do that? They refused to accept the, the, uh, the motion. And in the lobby, Bert Aronson, who lives next door to you, guy lives right next door to you, Bert Aronson got me in the lobby because they were prepping me to, to run for office in that club. They didn't want me to leave. He says, Alan, here's my card. Tomorrow, come to my office, and we'll discuss this. But we can't condemn Louis Farrakhan and Maud Ford Lee now because we need the black vote in the upcoming election, and that would stir them up, and that would lose us the vote. I took his card, I ripped it up, and I dropped it on the floor, and I walked out. That was the last Democrat club meeting I had attended, because I, as a Jew, a fervent Jew, uh, feel that I do not want to belong to a party that is not anti-Semitic. I don't use the term anti-Semitic anymore. I use the term, I don't want to belong to a party that is Jew-hating. So I left. I am not a Republican. I am a, an independent conservative. If Barack Obama ran on the Republican ticket, of which I'm, I, I'm signed up as a Republican because I have to vote in the primary, if Barack Obama or Hillary Clinton ran on the Republican ticket, I would not vote for them. I am not a die-hard political guy. But I've met people on the other side who were die-hard political. I ran against Bert Aronson in 2004 for county commissioner. I got whacked. <laughs> I was killed. But I, was, I knew I was going to get killed. I was standing outside of your library here on, in uh, the West LA Library just off Jog Road, and I was handing out leaflets. Two women came at me and attacked me physically. A man came over to me, the head of the Democrat Party in Delray Beach. He said, I'm going to punch you right in the nose. I said, go ahead and do it. Go ahead and do it. I called the cops, and he had uh, a, a certificate where he couldn't come near me. I see hostility. I see absolute, flagrant, outrageous hostility. Here we are in a country. We fight together. I was in the army with guys. I probably they they were Republicans, and they were Democrats, but we were together. We depended on one another for survival. That's what I was taught. There was no such thing as you're Jewish, you're Catholic, you're Presbyterian. We were all together. In Yiddish, the term was the Zenit Zaman. 
we are together. Now I see a, a terrible divide in this country, and honestly, I do not know if we're ever going to get back together again. I, I really don't know. I see, for instance, that the Democrats, and I'm mentioning this, are unhinged. They are psychologically unhinged. Think carefully. Maxine Waters, you know Maxine Waters? She's a California big Democrat. Big Maxine Waters. Uh, she said today, and I quote, um, the Republicans are a bunch of scumbags. She called me and others who are American citizens scumbags. I've never heard Maxine Waters call ISIS, Fatah, Hamas, Hezbollah, Iranians. I've never heard her call them scumbags. But because I am a conservative and I vote against her party, I am a scumbag. And then you have Nancy Pelosi, who basically, I'm not going to say anything, I'm not a psychologist, so I'm not going to say anything about Nancy Pelosi. She said about Republicans, and this is a quote, they pray on Sunday and then pray on ordinary people the rest of the week, which means conservatives pray on people, P-R-E-Y on people, we attack people, we, we take things away from them, this is basically not politics. This is not politics anymore. This is dirty ball game, and, and this is gonna hurt us, and I'm concerned. So I say to you liberals, progressives, whatever you wanna call yourselves, Democrats, uh, get on with your life. Get on with your life. The election is over. You lost. Eight years ago, when Barack Obama, who is a Jew hater from day one. A Jew hater from day one. The United Trinity Church of Christ in Chicago with the Reverend Jeremiah Wright called Jews names, basically called for the destruction of Israel. And the man who sat in his pews for 20 years ran for president and 78% of the Jews voted for him. I didn't go nuts. I didn't scream. What I did is I said, here I am, I'm available to talk. As a Jewish conservative, I'll talk to liberal groups. I'll do it, and I did it. I didn't go nuts. I didn't threaten people. I didn't challenge people. I said, let's have discourse. Let's discuss. You have your viewpoint, I'll have my viewpoint. That's how we do it. We don't have duels anymore, we don't fight. That's my concern. Now, Trump won. Nobody in this room really expected him to win. I didn't. I spoke for him. I, I did placards for him. I did whatever I had to do. I did it as a means of survival. I didn't think he was going to win. At 3.30 in the morning, I'm sitting up watching television, and I heard that Ohio, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Florida went for Trump. I said, something is here. Something is happening here. He won. Get over it. He's your president. He's going to rule over you whether you like it or not. He's going to appoint the next Supreme Court justice whether you like it or not. Live with it. Get on with your lives. Now, my concern is the attack on Trump. Trump was not a politician had no political history, none whatsoever. He was never in the Senate, he was never in the House, he was never in the state office, he was never in the city office. Who knows if he was the head of the PTA in school? I don't know. But he's our president now, and he's being attacked. Ivanka Trump, his daughter, who just spoke up yesterday for women, saying that the women's wages should be raised. Ivanka Trump, was, was nearly physically attacked on an airplane. Did you know about that? No, you didn't know about that. You didn't know about it. And I'll tell you why you didn't know about it. Do you know that two days ago in front of our house in Washington, D.C., she has money. She has big bucks. She has a nice big house in Washington, D.C. She deserves it. There was a crowd out there chanting, frothing at the mouth, following her around. They're calling Trump an idiot. Man went to Wharton, 
School of Business. I would love it if my kid went to the Wharton School of Business. My kid couldn't get in, but he didn't even try. He went to Wharton School of Business. He's not an idiot. He's a billionaire. He made money. He was not a politician. And a lot of Republicans, a lot of people on my side of the aisle don't like him either. Do you know why they don't like him? Because he has no baggage. They can't threaten him with anything. They can't say, well, listen, remember when you were a congressman, you did this, you did that? They can't say that. So a lot of people are envious of him. But I'm concerned about the pure vitriolic hatred that's flooding the country today politically. That's, that's my concern. Uh, then look what the Democrats did. They couldn't believe in a million years that Hillary Clinton could lose. How could she lose? The New York Times said she's ahead by 20 points the first week of November. The New York Times said she's ahead by 20 points. Other polls, you know the polls? The Chachams, you know what Chacham means in Hebrew? The brilliant people said, she's 10 to 1, she's going to win. Can't lose, ahead by 5 points, ahead by 8 points, ahead by 10. Can't lose. And she lost. So the Democrats say, what the hell do we do now? Whom? do we blame? Do we blame ourselves? Uh, you can't blame us. Let's see. Let's have a recount. We'll call for a recount of the votes in Ohio. They get screwed on that. Let's do it in Pennsylvania. Let's have a recount of the votes in Pennsylvania. They get screwed on that. Let's have a recount on the votes in Michigan. My wife's family comes from Michigan. They all went to Michigan State and, you know, these lunatics with football. He won in Michigan State, in Michigan, after the recounts. He won in all of those states. They said, wait a second. Something is wrong. He won the election. The people voted him. Whom else can we blame? Let's blame Russia. Let's make up a story that he collaborated with Russia. Let's make up the story. And as of today, that story is falling apart, falling apart, flat on his face. Let me ask you a question about Russia. What, you know, this is in the news today, what relationships had Trump ever had with Russia? I, I don't know of any. What reason would he have to bring Russia in to help with this election? I don't know. They said that Russia took and got into Hillary Clinton's emails in John Podesta's emails, am I right? But the news that, we don't know. There has been no proof as to Russia hacking their emails. But my saying to you is, if, they did, if someone did hack Hillary's emails or John Podesta's emails or the DNC's emails, were there any lies in those emails? Was it ever proven that those emails were false emails? Those were true emails. So whoever accessed those emails came out with the truth. Now, let's talk a little bit about history. Why would Trump want to ally himself with Russia? But let's look at the other way around. Why would Hillary ally herself with Russia? Are you aware that when Hillary took over as Secretary of State, she went to Moscow and she brought a little red button? Do you remember the little red reset button? It's on TV, not on MSNBC or CBS or PBS, NPR radio. She had a reset button and she went there and she said, I'm pressing this reset button. The United States and Russia are now going to have a more convivial relationship. You don't remember that? You remember when Barack Obama had a meeting with the president of Russia, Medvedev, a few years back, do you remember that? and there was an open mic, an open mic, and Barack Obama was caught saying to Medvedev, you tell Putin, as soon as I win my second term, we'll be able to work more warmly together. I'm paraphrasing, do you remember that? Do you remember in Obama's beginning term when Hillary was Secretary of State, and all these things occurred when she was Secretary of State, Do you remember 
when Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama removed the anti-missile ballistic systems from Poland and Czechoslovakia, at the insistence of Putin, they removed the anti-ballistic missile systems from Poland and Czechoslovakia, leaving them vulnerable to the Russian threats because Russia then was starting to move on the Crimea. Do you remember when Russia moved on the Crimea? The missiles were removed. And do you remember when Russia moved into Crimea? Do you remember what we supplied the Crimeans, the poor Crimeans? Did we supply them with weapons? No, we listened to Putin. We supplied them with MREs, which is meals ready to eat. We gave them meals ready to eat, not, not uh, military equipment. So Hillary Clinton, as Secretary of State, was very warm was very warm and friendly to Russia with the missiles, with the reset button, and with not saying anything to Crimea about the Crimea. And do you remember, do you, are you aware that Russia owns 20% of our uranium deposits in the Midwest? Are you aware of that? Russia, under Hillary Clinton when she was Secretary of State, took over 20% of our uranium, uranium deposits in the West. This was just after Bill Clinton received $500,000 for a head in the soup speaking engagement in Russia. And this was after $20 million was sent to the Clinton Foundation by Russian businesses. So I am telling you that there was play for pay or pay for play while Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State, she used that office, she used that office as a personal income production thing. And that's one of the reasons she lost the election, because people were aware of this. And now we're being told that, of all people, Trump is friendly towards Russia. For what purpose? He doesn't need any of their money. He doesn't have to be bribed, but she was bribed. And for some strange reason, Barack Obama had a friendship deal with Putin. He said to Medvedev, when I come into term, my second term, it's going to be easier for me to work with Putin. So we have that problem. I, I would like you to just think a little bit about, uh, about the hatred. Do you know that, do you know what uh, fake, uh, fake news is all about? Trump is being hit like a machine gun with fake news. Just earlier this week, a report came out in the New York Times that Angela Merkel, you know who Angela Merkel is? She's the Prime Minister, the President of Germany. She was handed a bill by Trump for $345 billion that she must pay because of our troops are uh, stationed in Germany all these years. That was fake. Came out a couple of days later, that's not the truth. This is fake. Chris Matthews compared Trump's kids to Saddam Hussein's kids. Chris Matthews, who was the leading spokesperson on television for the Democrat, said that the, the Trump children are compared to Saddam Hussein's kids. Saddam Hussein's kids were murderers. They burned people alive. But this is what MSNBC was sending out to the people who listened to MSNBC. Spicer, you know who Spicer is? the spokesperson that you see him on television every day, he's a spokesperson for Trump. He came out and he said, you know what? If, uh, if Trump uses Russian dressing on a salad, everyone is gonna know about it and everyone is gonna scream about it. The news came out, MSNBC and CNN, CNN said, he's wrong. Russian dressing is never used on salads, it's used on sandwiches. I mean, anything he says is absolutely going to... Did you hear about what CNN said? That in the Easter egg hunt on the White House lawn, two weeks from now, they're going to only use golden eggs. Did you hear that? Then they retracted that and they said, well, no, he's going to use the pastel Easter colored egg. Anything he says, if he uses the wrong toilet paper, 
you're going to get a, a notice in the newspaper that says, Trump is using this terrible, terrible toilet paper. He can't get away with it. Now, I, I, like I say, I, I lived with Obama for eight years. I didn't go around speaking, condemning him. I listened to Robert Watson, Professor Robert Watson. I go to his lectures. I want to hear what he has to say. And I hear what he has to say, and it's basically vindictive. And this is a professor, basically harsh, basically harsh, basically vindictive. He doesn't come out and bring people together. He splits people apart. Uh, I never called for Obama, I, for Obama to die. I never called for him to be killed. I never called for him to be impeached. He was elected president, honestly. I lived with it, lived with it. Let's face the facts. Hillary Clinton lost because she was a crappy candidate. She was a terrible candidate. Let's go over it. I, I have to read this because I can't memorize this all. Remember she called Republicans deplorable? 40% of the United States she called deplorable people. This has a reaction. You can't fool around with the American people. You can't fool around the citizens. They're going to react. Call them deplorable. Uh, do you remember the Benghazi scandal? She came out and she said, for two weeks after that, the Benghazi attack, the killing of uh, our ambassador and the three other guys was caused by a videotape that some cockamamie Muslim guy in California put out. Even after they knew that it was a terrorist, a well-planned, coordinated terrorist attack with mortars, with rocket propeller grenades, she still said that the Benghazi attack was caused by, by this, this, this video. Then, if you remember, she supported the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Do you remember when Mubarak was thrown out of Egypt? Do you remember when Hosni Mubarak was thrown out of Egypt? They had an election. And whom did she support? And whom did Obama support? They supported a guy by the name of Mohammed Morsi. Have you ever heard of Mohammed Morsi? He is Muslim Brotherhood. He's a killer. He's a killer. Muslim Brotherhood wants Jews and Christians dead. They wanted him as president, and he was elected president. And we knew that. We knew that she supported him. He was eventually kicked out with a guy named El Sisi. El Sisi just met Donald Trump this week. I'm going to get more onto that. Then, do you remember? Do you know who Huma Abedin is? Is there anyone here who does not know who Huma Abedin is? Huma Abedin is, was second in charge of Secretary of State, Hillary's best friend, who was Muslim Brotherhood. In the State Department, reading every single top secret memo, was a woman by the name of Huma Abedin. You look her up on your computer, A-B-E-D-I-N, Huma Abedin. Huma Abedin is Muslim Brotherhood, her father was Muslim Brotherhood. Her, Muslim, her mother runs the Muslim Brotherhood, the Muslim Sisterhood in Saudi Arabia, and her brother runs it in Oxford, England. And this was a woman who was second in charge of the State Department. When Benghazi was aflame, when Egypt was aflame, and when Syria was aflame, all of this upheaval in the Middle East was when Hillary was Secretary of State and Huma Abedin was her right-hand assistant. Then, do you remember the Iran deal, the Iranian deal? Was that popular with you, even though you were Democrats? Giving Iran the opportunity to have an atomic bomb and giving Iran $165 billion? This was done under her administration. This is why she lost the election. This is why she A lot of people, for some strange reason, a lot of people don't like to hear this. They abscond. They run away. They hide. In Yiddish, they say, Zug me nicht de emes. Don't tell me the truth. Tell me only what I want to hear. If you tell me something that I don't want to hear, I'm going to run away and I'm going to hide. And that's what people do. Here is the Sun Sentinel. The Susan Rice. Are you aware of the Susan Rice expose? This is going to be bigger than Watergate. In the Sun Sentinel today, there's not one mention of the Susan Rice episode. Because the people who don't want to hear about it will not be told it. This paper says, we want subscribers. 
So we don't want to harass and bother our readers. We want our readers to know only what they want to hear. For instance, the most important news of the day in the Sun Sentinel, pray for your haters, Ali's ex-wife tells FIU students, and Airbnb to collect hotel, to, I don't even know what Air, I don't even know what Airbnb is. And this is the news. Four days without seeing mommy and daddy and Trump's guest critic. We are being fed. The liberals are being fed by the mainstream media exactly what they want to hear. They don't say, listen, I'll pick up the Wall Street Journal. I watch MSNBC throughout the day. I watch CNN throughout the day. I want to know what the other side is, is saying. Because if not, I come to you and you ask me questions, I don't know what the hell to say. So I listen to the other side. I accumulate knowledge from all sides. If I say to people, when's the last time you watch Fox News? If I watch Fox News, I'll turn into a pillar of salt. Basically what they have to say. So my concern is, we have a problem. Now, take a look at what Trump has done. He's been in office less than 80 days. Less than 80 days has he been in office. Did he fail on the revocation and the change in Obamacare? Yes, he did. And that's a good deal. You know why? Let the Republicans in Congress and the Senate and the House, let them make changes. Without, he is not the leader. This is what I, I want a president who is not the leader of his party. I want the people in his party to be able to express opinions and to be heard. I don't want a dictator as the head of my party because that's dangerous. If I were a Democrat, I would say, I want two sides. I want all parties of the Democrat party to speak out differently so that we'll get a consensus. Trump is going to get a consensus. For Barack Obama to have passed Obamacare took seven months. It's only, he's, Trump is only in office 70, 75 days. I have a kid cousin who's single. She has Obamacare. She spends 600 bucks a month for her premium. She has a $7,000 deductible. And she, will, and she has copay, which means she has to lay out about $14,000 before she's eligible to get any, any treatment. So my concern is, what Trump has done has been amazing. He's worked on Obamacare. He's working on reducing taxes. Uh, getting jobs, we, there were 325,000 jobs, and not jobs that we were getting over the last eight years. Over the last eight years, we were getting jobs that were less than 30 hours a week, which meant they weren't eligible for pension or health care. Now we're getting jobs. Companies are moving back into this country. He's offering firms like GE and GM, bring your company back to this country. Bring them back to this country. We'll give you special tax incentives, and they are listening to him. He has done much throughout this past 60 days. Um, but I, I, I want questions. So if I were a Democrat now, and I was a Democrat, and I know exactly how they feel, exactly. If I were a Democrat, I'd be a little frightened at this moment. I'd be a little concerned. You know why? I would look at my union base throughout the country. They're leaving the Democrat Party like, like flies. The only union that has been loyal to Barack Obama and to the Democrat Party is, are the teachers' unions. The teacher that I helped found, the union I have, the AFL-CIO, AFT, and the UFT, and the uh, American Educational Association. The union workers in Wisconsin, Ohio, Michigan, West Virginia are voting Republican. That's how Trump won the election. And no one saw this coming. Nobody saw this coming. When I saw, when I viewed his speeches, Trump's speeches, and I saw that there were thousands outside the arena, and the arena was packed, I said, something is up here. So I, I didn't understand it. I didn't put two and two together. Something was up. The coal miners in West Virginia and in Ohio and in Pennsylvania said, 
Obama told us he was going to close all the coal mines and he was going to close down the coal business. You remember that. Now these people have families. They have kids. What were they going to do? I was, my brother lived in West Virginia for years, in southwestern Virginia. He was an economics professor at the University of Virginia. And I saw the way they lived. This is like living on the Riviera. I mean, these people live in shacks. They were going to be out of jobs. The coal mines were closing. And Trump said, I'm going to bring coal back. If you were a devout Democrat for 80 years and you heard somebody say that and you're a coal miner, for whom would you vote? You'd vote for the Republican candidate. The steel workers, the XL pipeline was closed down basically by Obama and Hillary. He said, I'm going to open up that XL pipeline. If I'm a steel worker out in the Midwest where that pipeline was going to go, and I knew, and Trump promised that the steel in that pipeline was going to be made in America, I would say, I'm going to vote for that guy because I'm voting for my family and for my kids. I don't give a damn about what party I belong to. The steel workers voted for him. The oil workers voted for him. He was going to close down the oil wells. He said, we don't need any more petroleum. We're going to have solar power, we're going to have wind power. I went to my dealer to buy a Chevy last week and I said, facetiously, I said, do you have one with a windmill on the top? The guy said, no, are you crazy? He's bringing the oil, the shale mining. He's bringing them back and these people need jobs and he's giving it to them. That's why he won the election and that's why the Democrats lost the election. They assumed, like the people who walked out of this this event tonight. Obama and Hillary Clinton assume that everyone is going to vote for them blindly and religiously because they've been doing that all the years. Trump screwed them up. He had no, he had no motives. The guy is a billionaire. Why does he want to become a president of the United States? He has to be crazy. He says, I'm going in basically, and I'm going to use this term, to make America great again. And so far, so far he is doing it. North Korea, we have a problem with North Korea. If you were Kim Il Sung, whatever the hell the guy's name is in North Korea, whom would you want for president? A Hillary Clinton or would you want a Donald Trump? I would want a Hillary Clinton. If you were ISIS, which was supplied by weaponry by the United States for years in Syria, whom would you want for president? I would want Hillary Clinton in the Democrat Party because they've been good to me. They didn't do any bombing for the first couple of years. And if you were Putin, who is in Syria now, who went to Syria under Obama's administration and under Hillary Clinton's Secretary of State, would you want Donald Trump as president? I would want Hillary Clinton. And look at the latest, look at the latest scandals. Did you hear about the, the, the attack? Did you hear about the attack in Syria the other day with the children being gassed? Do you remember the red line that Barack Obama drew in the sand while Hillary was Secretary of State? He says, if they cross that line again and they have another chemical attack, they are gonna pay for it, we're gonna go in there. They did it again and he said, well, you know what, maybe the next time. What that did is that opened up Syria to Iran and to Russia. Who are the partners in Syria now fighting? Iran and Russia. Both of them had no fear of Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. Iran spit in our face. After we had the Iran deal, Iranian deal, which gave them the atom bomb, and we gave them $165 billion and more money, Iran says, we now do what we want. A week later, they said, we're going to test our intercontinental ballistic missile, and we're going to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. Did Hillary say a word? Nothing. Did Obama say a word? If I was Iran, I would pray that Hillary Clinton got in. I would be scared to death of, Barack, of, of uh, Trump. Now look at this. Hillary Clinton back in 2011, 
applauded Assad of Syria. She said, Syrian President Assad regarded as a reformer, Clinton says. I pulled this off the web today. She was a supporter of Assad. She supported the guy who just gassed hundreds of kids. Nancy Pelosi, you know who Nancy Pelosi is. She traveled to Syria in 2007 with Keith Ellison. Do you know who Keith Ellison is? Second in charge of the Democrat National Committee, Jew hater, Israel hater, Muslim Brotherhood, member of the Council on American Islamic Relations, and he was an officer of the Nation of Islam under Louis Farrakhan. And now he's the second in charge of the DNC, the Democrat National Committee, which runs the Democrat Party. Nancy Pelosi traveled to Syria, and she said here, I'm doing it anyway. Do you know why? Back in 2003, George W. Bush stopped relations with Syria. He said he's a killer, and I don't want to have anything to do with that. He pulled our ambassador out of Syria. Nancy Pelosi went, contrary to George Bush's warnings, went to Syria to befriend Assad, who is now a killer. Who put him in power? Democrat. Now, talk about Keith Ellison. I'm Jewish. Keith Ellison, to me, is a pariah. I'm scared to death of the guy. He's a Muslim. He's a member of the House of Representatives. He's a member of the Council on American Islamic Relations, which is Muslim Brotherhood. Did you know this, his relationships? I do. And that's why I speak out. He was going to be the head of the Democrat National Committee. And who sponsored him to be the head of the Democrat National Committee? Chucky Schumer of New York, the leading Jew in the Senate is putting in a Jew hater for the DNC. He lost the election by 15 votes, so now they said, well, he'll be the assistant to the head of the DNC, which is the first time that position ever opened up. They made a position for Keith Ellison, for a Jew hater. Do you know what Resolution 2334 was for the Security Council? It condemned Israel two months ago. Three months ago, condemned Israel, Resolution 2334. Barack Obama in the Security Council did not vote against it. He did not veto it. He abstained. The Security Council passed 11 to nothing, a condemnation of Israel, a condemnation of Israel to destroy Israel. And she stood by and she said nothing, Hillary Clinton. And then in the House of Representatives, when they voted to condemn that resolution in the House, Democrats and Republicans all got together. Nancy Pelosi voted for Resolution 234 in the House, together with 60 other Democrats. So I'm saying to you now, I'm going to end it now, I'm going to ask for your question. What I'm saying to you now is, I would suggest those of you who have been Democrats all your lives, as I was, a Jewish umbilical cord Democrat or whatever, those of you who have been Democrats all your lives, Think a little bit. You don't live in the same crappy one-bedroom apartment you were raised in when you, were, when you were a kid. You're not wearing the same clothes you wore. You're not wearing the same clothes. Uh, clothes. You're not eating the same food. You've changed. All I'm asking you is to consider thinking a little bit and perhaps thinking about changing your outlook. Now, hit me with questions. I'd love it. 